So welcome everyone um, to our very special event. Uh, my name is Eliana and I'm one of the organisers um, of Voices of Wentworth. I'm here with some of our co-organisers, Delia, Blair, Kath, Helen, um, and we're all really looking forward to chatting with you um, later on tonight. Uh, first and foremost, we would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Gadigal people, of the Aurora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And before handing over to our special guest, uh, Dan Illich, to introduce our two great, exciting authors, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, Voices of Wentworth. We actually started just a couple of months ago, and it's amazing what you can accomplish with a little bit of passion, ambition, and frustration. Um, we, uh, we, we came together first and foremost on the frustration we had about the lack of political action on climate change and emissions reduction. Other issues um, that have emerged include lack of media diversity and aspects of Australian democracy, declining voter engagement in political issues, lack of transparency and accountability from federal MPs, and the lack of a National Integrity Commission, which is fit for purpose. We were also inspired by movements in Moringa and Indy and that were dedicated and set up their own community groups to see what the reception might be. And they had a very positive reaction and we believe we will have the same here. Many Wentworth voters are concerned about the same issues that we're concerned about and we want to be that group to help bring those voices to the table. Um, our speakers so far have, have included Blair Polisi, who's one of our um, co-organisers. Uh, she is the co-founder of 350.org and here today. We've had economist Monica Richter, sustainability advisor Ma uh, Maria Atkinson, uh, and outside the electorate, we've had uh, the uh, current chair of the Centre of Public Int Integrity, Anthony Wheely QC, and also Saffron Zoma from the Australian Democracy Network. In our next session, we'll look at key aspects emerging from um, federal ICAC legislation recently released, um, together with alternative legislation introduced by the independent MP for Indy, Dr Hel um, Helen Haynes. I think what we just really wanted to emphasise today that um, is that while we came together uh, because of our frustration about lack of political action on climate change, Voices of Wentworth is really a group that is about trying to understand the voices and of the Wentworth electorate and what um, issues uh, really matter to you. And this really is a non-partisan group, <laughs> despite the, um, the, the tweet we got from Dave Sharma about being Voices for Labor. Uh, which I must confess made me a bit cross. Uh, but but in, the, in the same vein, I think it's really important that we, we are Voices for Wentworth and, and in that uh, we do want people from all uh, parts of, of the electorate to come forward and help us understand what really matters so we can be that voice um, back to our federal MP. Uh, I probably just want to end really um, by saying that you can connect with us um, on the website. Uh, we're having regular town halls. Please sign up. Um, please give us suggestions on how we can improve the way we do things uh, and also um, advocate for us if you really enjoy um, tonight uh, with, with your friends and, and family. Uh, so that, that's the way we can um, continue to advance, um, advance our community group. I um, before I hand over to Dan Illich, I just wanted to share that Dan Illich, who is our um, moderator for the Q and A today, uh, was just um, who just won. <laughs> what was it? The best comedy podcast in Australia. Irrational fear. Well done. So please check it out. Over to you, Dan. Um, I'm, I don't know why you're not at home listening to it right now. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. It's so great for all of you to tear yourselves away from the Guardian Live blog to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's a thrill to be here. And it's, it's groups like this that are really important. It's groups like this that can make real difference. And it's a thrill to have all of you like-minded folks in a room like this. And it's going to be a thrill to talk to these two great thought leaders in the space to help us arm ourselves with the knowledge to share with others. So um, these two great thinkers here, actually, I just found out
about earlier. Uh, they both had climate change epiphanies while walking across the United Kingdom uh, together, separately. They did it together, but separately, and you'll hear more about that. First up is Marion Wilkinson. Marion Wilkinson is one of our great journalistic brains. She has worked for Four Corners, been the executive producer there. She's worked as deputy editor at the City Morning Herald. She's worked all over the world as a foreign correspondent, and um, she is extraordinary. She's written this book called The Climate Club. I bought my uh, copy today, uh, as you can do. I've seen this book everywhere, in every shop. I've read so much about it and I've been meaning to get it, so it's awesome to get it here today. Um, now, The Climate Club was listed by the Financial Times as one of the best books of 2020, which is extraordinary for a book about climate change. Well done. If ever you wanted a textbook to work out why we have 100 prime ministers in five years, this is the book right here. Uh, Marion joins us. Also, Sarah Wilson, good friend of mine, Bondi resident. Um, Sarah is also well known, most likely, for the I Quit Sugar series, but she's written a book about climate change as well uh, called This One Wild and Precious Life. And it is an extraordinary book uh, that it helps, uh, that is, it is, it's like a guiding light to help us during overwhelming times. And it's a wonderful ramble about your inner space, how you should be thinking about it, how you should be talking about climate. Uh, not only it touches very lightly on the facts and figures, but touches mostly on how to tell stories in this time and how you should be thinking about this. And it's extraordinary. It's a beautiful read. It will make you laugh and it will make you cry. Uh, it's a very precious book. So please welcome Sarah Wilson. Sarah, I... I don't know why you didn't call the book I Quit Carbon. Uh, I assume it's because um, it's a little too, little too difficult. The, the website domain had been taken. There was no future. Joel Fitzgibbon has that website. It goes to his website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dave Sharma's got it. Yep, yep. Um, well, let's start off, Marion. Let's start off with you. Um, you know, climate change, addressing climate change meaningfully in this country has been often been put in the too hard basket and when anybody has attempted to do it in a meaningful way they've lost their jobs so what can we do as voters in this moment now to encourage our elected uh, officials and lawmakers to act fast and act hard on climate well i think at the end of the day you've got to persuade them that this is the time. There's a wonderful public servant, there's a lot of wonderful public servants in my book who try to do something about climate change. So it's not just a negative book, but one of the recent public servants who've tried to do that is a woman called Audrey Zibelman. And she, most people haven't heard of her, but she's been absolutely crucial in whether this country will move to renewable energy. She's leaving her office um, probably next week, and I suspect very frustrated. But I was listening to her with speak to a group of um, energy executives a couple of weeks ago. And she left them with these parting words. And the words were, just remember, we are the last generation who can prevent climate change. And I think that if you want to put a message to Wentworth and put a message to what you want to do uh, in Wentworth to politicians and political leaders, it's that message and I've watched this debate for 15 years. I've watched that message not get through in Australia. And I think now's the time it has to get through. Um, Sarah, you think a lot about how to talk to people about climate change. Uh, do you think this is about communicating to our elected officials or do you think, that's, do you think we are at a problem where we need to connect with normal people? Well, I actually think it's... Um, option C, if I can put it in option C, and I think that is actually appealing to, bin, uh, to business and industry. I think the greatest change is going to occur there, and I think the dial has been shifting um, without us really seeing it, and I think it's actually starting to gather some real momentum around the place. Um, only in the last couple of months we've seen really big businesses um, partner with Greenpeace to make these announcements um, 
they're, they're committing to the Paris Agreement themselves and they're committing in a really tangible way. So Woolworths, Aldi, Bunnings, Officeworks, there's a whole bunch that are kind of lining up going, this makes sense. The Business Council of Australia supports Zali Stegel's uh, Climate Act Now bill. Um, you know, industry's getting behind it and as sceptical as you might be about BlackRock and some of these big institutions, they, they're going to be held to account. They're going to have to make tangible changes. And the fact that these white male institutions are stepping up, it really helps. It's a little bit like what we saw during the um, bushfires and post-bushfires when we saw the movement to get all the... Um, the, the, the firefighters coming together and actually talk about climate change. I think that was one of the most powerful things we've seen. And um, so it's these kinds of movements that are starting to happen. Now they start to happen because I think at an individual level we start to agitate. And there's a lot of data that shows when individuals come together and start to agitate in a peaceful but meaningful and revolutionary way, you do come across change. And Marion, you might have come across that Erica Chenoweth um, study that talks about three and a half percent figure. She studied every um, sort of political movement, every political action that's taken place since 1900 and 2004. And she analysed it quite in a detailed way um, in her tenureship at Harvard and found that um, every time you get three and a half percent of a population um, voicing up on something, then the change comes about. So I think it's going to be us in conjunction with industry, and then I think that government will step into line after that. Well, I'm, I'm not very good at maths, but I think we've got about 1.5% of Wentworth right here. So just to get a few more friends to the next gathering, it'll be great. Have you seen industry change this year? Have you, I, particularly around, I've seen a lot of stuff from the Beyond Zero Emissions folks. Have you seen how much industry is changing the way they're talking? Uh, to me, that has been the most remarkable thing. And oddly, it's happened since the 2019 election when everyone was sort of quite, I think, deflated about any chance of action on climate change. But you're now seeing, um, as Sarah was saying, so many major financial institutions, but also some big companies, companies like whether it's AGL or BHP saying, you know, they have all these aspirations of getting to net zero by 2050. But there's also real change going on. And I think you just have to look at the fact that people like Twiggy Forrest a teaming up with Mike Cannon Brooks uh, on a Sun Cable project, uh, which is a massive solar project to bring solar power to Singapore and Northern Australia. That tells me that it's changing. What isn't changing, sadly, I think, is Canberra. They're, they're the outliers now. Now, Canberra is, the Canberra bubble is the bubble that isn't being pierced right now. Uh, all the states and territories are all signed on to net zero by 2050. Uh, it's almost a moot point for Canberra at this point, but they are pushing hard for their gas-led recovery. And the gas-led recovery isn't going to be much of a recovery for the people investing in gas-led recoveries. Um, how do you think we can reach the key players in Canberra, Sarah? Oh, gosh. Um it's probably not the realm that I tend to work to. I tend to, I am mainstream. I have spoken um, to the masses all of my career. So I've always taken, I guess, well, let's just say sensible ideas um, to the masses, whether it's quitting sugar or whether it's um, talking about anxiety beyond the pharmaceutical model and now, I guess, climate and, and really activating change. So I tend to work in that realm and I do do you think, though, I mean, funnily enough, Marion and I were talking about it earlier, I started out in the press gallery um, shuffling papers for um, um, Michelle Grattan. <laughs> I was her research assistant at the Finn Review many, many years ago. And so I sort of had a bit of an insight into the Canberra bubble. And of course, you know, I grew up just outside the Canberra bubble. Um, so I think that I'm more interested in getting um, the minds and hearts of, you know, everyday Australians um, to shift their perspective and to feel empowered. And my thing is looking at psychological shifting that occurs when you start to see people engaging at the level of 
buying a keep cup instead of using takeaway coffee cups. And we, we get bamboozled and overwhelmed by these measures, but um, the science shows that action begets action. And, and when you start to look at the anxiety that is causing a lot of Australians not to be active in this space, and this is a really big issue because, of course, our politicians are there because we vote for them. And sometimes what happens is we become so overwhelmed, we go into a survival mechanism called the freeze mechanism. And that is actually one of the most dangerous things we can do. So I think there needs to be a simultaneous discussion. You've got Marion who can start talking about these political um, ramifications and exposing how dirty the scene is that we're not seeing, you know, um, in, from outside that bubble. But I think we also at the same time need to get people feeling that they, they can be empowered and that, that doing small things will make a difference and that it does create a momentum. Um, and that action will actually o overcome the overwhelm that, that sends us into an acedia a, a sort of an, an, a, a stuckness that I feel Australia in, in particular at a political level but also at an at a activation level, I think we suffer from it tremendously in part because of our economic opulence of the last 30 years. I don't know if I answered any particular question there. No, that was good. Yeah, I rambled successfully. No. Uh, acedia is a phrase or a word that comes up a lot in your book. I first came across it in your book. Um, and... Can you articulate that feeling just a little bit, a little bit more? Um, acedia is a is a Greek term, um, and it essentially means a listless slothfulness, which is very hard to say when you've got a slight lisp. Um, but it's it comes about when um, and and various philosophers, I think. Um, in the 13th century discussed it and it's it's reared its head as a term to describe what happens when when opulence kicks in and we start to get very stuck and sort of it's the, the, the equivalent today with the visual Does it of sound it like any country in particular <laughs> it's the person on the couch with the Twitter in one hand, the remote in the other. They've got Uber Eats on their way. They don't even have to wonder how long their pizza is going to take because there's a little orb that shows them exactly how long it's going to be. Um, they can opine without being exposed. Um, and it's it's a it's it's not a laziness. It's worse than that. It's an inaction. It's a foggy headedness. And of course, what that does is prevent us from rising and going to our edge, going to the edge of political thinking, um, intellectual thought, so that we can we can save our asses, basically. And I, I think the problem that we face in Australia today can be in part explained by an acedia that comes around from economic opulence. Now, it also comes about from the flight or fight mechanism you have when that's exhausted and we feel that there's nowhere to go, we will go into freeze mode at a psychological level. And so people who have been victims of assault um, will go into a freeze mode where it's a self-protection mechanism that you, you bring about when there's nowhere else to go. And a deer will do it being chased by a tiger. It'll play dead and it'll give itself a chance for the tiger to wander off and maybe get its cubs. And it will then use that pause, that freeze, to then reactivate and, and ricochet back into life and escape. Now, it's the final mechanism, right? We're in that freeze space. <laughs> and what we need to do is jerk ourselves out of it because otherwise we hold on to that anxiety and we go into a sedia. Uh, Marion, for you, what do you think is the most effective communication tool to folks in Canberra or... Do folks in Canberra know what they have to do but are willfully ignoring it because their jobs are on the line? I think it's very much the latter. I think the rather sort of tragic thing for Australia is that when you look at the opinion polls, pretty much the, the majority of people do do want action on climate change. They do want to move to a, a clean economy. There's very good reason why that's not happening, even though the majority of Australians want it. And I think what I try to explain in the book is why that happens. And it's because a lot of very clever people have worked out how you can wedge your political opponent in enough very specific seats that you can actually uh, win an election, even though a number of your key policies like climate change don't match up with what people are thinking. And I think that's why uh, it's worth examining those things. That's why I wanted to examine them because we're still trapped in that. 
And that's what's happening at the moment. I think that if you start breaking it down, you can look at the forces, very powerful and influential forces in this country who do want to keep the system we have, who do want to keep the gas-led recovery um, and everything that goes with it. And I think that you can put out an alternative message, and that is a message of hope to people so that they don't fear that they will lose their jobs, that they don't fear that they'll lose their sports grounds, their communities, their way of life, their fishing clubs, all those things that can go in regional Australia if you don't have jobs and you don't have an income. And I think that what our politicians have largely done on both sides of the spectrum in both major parties is to spread a message of fear in regional Australia that you will lose all this. And I think explaining that there is a way where we can transition where you don't have to be frightened of the future. That's what matters. And is that the reality, though? Is, is the message there sending the reality or is it the inverse? Uh, it's not the reality. I think the sad part for a lot of Australians living in those regions is it's the reverse. What's happening in the world now, as Sarah mentioned before, is that a lot of companies are moving on and we will find in a few years, a lot of these big coal companies, and I've looked at them and I've talked to some people who've worked for them at very senior levels, they've got it, they've worked out, they're not going to make money out of these things anymore. They have a timetable about how far they can push it. And when they push it, they will pull up stumps, walk away and they won't care about retraining the workers. They won't care about rehabilitating those lands. They won't care about what happens to those communities. And they certainly won't care about the member in that marginal seat. But I think what we've got to do is to say, you know, we've got to act for Australians, not for vested interests. And when we do that, then you can plan for a transition exactly like what's happening in the Latrobe Valley at the moment. How much do we need to raise to buy the Liberal Party? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, as MasterCard might say, priceless. I don't. <laughs> um, I think that. You know, there are a lot of, uh, there's been a lot written about political donations and certainly I've written a bit about it. But you know what's really weird is it's not that much money in That's a lot of cases. This is the richest electorate in Australia. We could chip in. <laughs> as, um, as an old Labor politician once said to me, many of these blokes, you could buy them for a good feed of fish and chips. <laughs> I think the Zali campaign got off the ground for, what, one bit over a mil? Which, you know, in that electorate. But, hey, you're right, we're in this electorate, so, yeah. Yeah, th this one's a lot, Maritzia. Um, Sarah, we've got Christmas coming up. Marion, super... Question without notice, superannuation. David... David Brainbridge, uh, lawyer, has recently taken rest superannuation to court and settled out of court uh, because uh, one of his clients demanded that they be transparent with how their their money is being spent and they've gone all uh, uh, carbon neutral by 2050, including the investments that they make. Is this a trend we're seeing? It's a huge trend, but funnily enough, it's not just superannuation. And I think... It's amazing how fast we are moving because now we're seeing the major banks that have backed in uh, fossil fuel industries forever are now realising that the profits they expected are not going to be there. So it's not just superannuation, it's actually the major banks that are also going carbon neutral by 2050. It's a business case. Sarah, mm. Christmas is coming up. Uh, I've got a family full of climate deniers. Uh, what's the best way to not leave bloodied and bruised from Christmas lunch? 
first, and this is where I think it's an interstitial moment, like you would have this in your podcast where you pause to thank a sponsor. I'm just going to point out to people that Gertrude and Alice, a local business, is down the, is just down that corner, um, selling copies of our books. Um, so I think it's Jimmy and Jane are over there. Um, so do support them rather than buying it from Amazon. Um, so anyway, so uh, Christmas, yes, buy our books. Yep. That's a good start. Um, As and, gifts for your family for Christmas. That's right, especially the climate deniers. Um, my book takes a slightly different um, position and I went down into the rabbit hole um, of all of the climate data, both here and overseas and why we weren't shifting and all the various um, politics and the science behind it and everything. And it was around about uh, this time last year that I just hit... Um, an existential kind of quagmire and went into a very, very dark place. Um, and, of course, shortly after the the, fire, the bushfires happened, um, which just darkened things further. And, and so my book was put on hold. I know yours was delayed as well. Um, and I went and sort of wrote in some of the, the bushfire stuff and then, of course, COVID happened and then I paused and, and I've got some friends here who lived through all of this with me. Um, and I paused and I sat back and I watched and, and sort of then was able to, you know, sort of insert some more information and then Black Lives Matter happened. COVID got us all pausing and thinking about this stuff or at least um, pausing long enough to perhaps read a book. But I think that um, I think that my approach, when I went into that dark hole, I realised that I'd actually committed to my publisher and to everyone around me that I was going to find a hopeful path forward. And I was like, gosh, I can't find it. And in fact, my meditation teacher, we live in the eastern suburbs, I can say such a thing, um, <laughs> said to me, now, Sarah, this is not like you. You live this way with joy, you know. You show us how you do it. Show us the charm. You've got to make this more charming than the status quo. Um, and he's he's known me for 10 years and he knows how I operate and, and that I do um, live minimally with absolute um, energy and just absolute commitment. So I had to go and find a path forward. And as it turns out, that path forward turned out to be far simpler, far more elegant and far more joyful than I could ever have imagined. And I was able to then progress further with the book and, and to leave behind the polarisation. And there's that Rumi quote, and again, we're in this distant suburbs, I can quote Rumi, um, you know, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And so I just feel that that's what we need to do at um, with recalcitrant uncles on Christmas Day is to actually find that meeting place. And you know, in the time uh, between sort of when I hit that um, existential dark spot and got the book out, I came across a number of studies that backed that. And so um, further data, further scientific information, it actually polarises people further. And off the back of the bushfires, I was thinking, like many of you, I'm sure, this is going to be the thing that's going to get us all woken up. Well, Ipsos, and I think it was the Fairfax, you know, uh, papers, as whatever they're called now, um, both did um, quite small scale studies on people's opinions about climate science off the back of the bushfires. And in fact, it was more polarised than I think six months earlier. And so th that idea that giving people more information um, is going to make a difference, it, it, it won't. It will amongst a group like us. Um, we'll just get more solidified. But the point is, on the other side of the fence, people also get more solidified in their thinking and the polarisation gets worse. So we've got to find ways to meet people in that field. And in fact, it's a far more charming way to go about things. Nobody wants to argue this out. We want to show people it's a no brainer. We want to show why this is just working. And that's why I feel like ex firemen fronting up and talking about climate change is wonderful because it gets people to go, oh, that's normalised, I get it, we can progress further. So, But I think, I think the th way to go about it is actually to find the common ground, the common ground where you can go, look, we really do want to make this planet worth living on, um, you know, and, and I think also talking about some of these industries, these industry leaders who are making the shift simply because it makes good financial sense and to talk jobs and growth if that's what it takes. I think we've got to go there and, and talk the language and then we gradually 
get to shift um, the dial. And the thing is about change is it's exponential once it's a, people realise it's a good idea and once it's more charming than the status quo. And we've got to live it and breathe it and find it joyful and to show people, to show people how it's done. Is there, is there one phrase I can use on my recalcitrant uncle? Is there one? Well, my, sorry about my language, but the, ti- the working title of my book up until really towards the end um, when I decided to get a little bit more gentle and slap a um, Mary Oliver poem on the cover um, was, <laughs> was Wake the Fuck Up. And I went around the world interviewing various um, philosophers and poets and everyone going, well, I haven't come up with sort of Wake the Fuck Up, but I'm not sure yet. Anyway, so you could try that one. Um, but another phrase, I mean, I think the Rumi poem. I think the Rumi... Um, well, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. And I think, um, yeah, I think that might be one way of doing it. Um, Marion, th- your, your book is, um, uh, is really big. Look at this big book here. Is there one Hey Martha moment? Yeah. Uh, well, there's, there's quite a few of those moments in the book. Uh, but I think... For me, one of those moments was I was sitting in a cafe in Washington and I was interviewing this young guy, very intelligent, erudite, um, very polite, and he had been a long-time activist for one of the far-right groups in America. He'd been trained at the Koch Brothers Institute there on how to run campaigns against climate change and he was telling me how he basically helped blow up Julia Gillard's climate policy from Washington and um, (laughs) and how he would organize uh, all these incredibly disparate people and organise them into very specific actions to trigger protests in Canberra. No way. Um, Sarah, for you as well, your book is a beautiful spiritual kind of uh, journey. It's a, like, like your, your hiking, it's a wonderful ramble through all sorts of disparate ideas. Is there one moment you want to bring to the table for us? Um, well, I, I, I guess, as you say, I tell stories and there's a chapter where um, I pull apart the neoliberal model and um, my biggest bookseller after Gertrude and Alice, which is my favourite bookseller, is Big W. Pulling apart the neoliberal model um, for, the, for Heartland Australia was a bit of a challenge. So what I would do is I would just think about these ideas as I hiked in various places. And for those of you who don't know me, I've lived out of one bag um, of belongings. It it reduced from two bags down to one bag to one 15 kilo bag for eight years. And so I wrote most of this book, Living on the Road This Way. Um, I have had furniture, albeit secondhand furniture, in Bondi for two and a half years, in part because I'm actually stuck here um, and I've got to sit on something. But um, so I I hiked um, in, in Switzerland and there I am following I thought in the footsteps of Heidi written by Joanna Spree I notice it's on um, I notice it is in fact in Gertrude and Alice just another sponsorship shout out here um, it's a children's book those of you who remember it it was you know she she goes and she's dis- she's a little child that gets sick from industrialization late 1880s in Switzerland and she gets sent to go and live with her grandfather in the Swiss Alps to hike and eat goat's milk and goat's cheese and and bread. And um, so I went to this town called Heidedorf, seriously, and uh, with my friend who can yodel. And um, we went hiking up there and this, and it used, kind of hub and spoke out from this small village, which you can only get to by horse and cart, seriously, in 2018, this was. And so I sort of stayed there, walked off, you know, with my yodel friend and um, we went and found Heidi Dorf. And I come back into this tiny little village called Sils Maria. And if you're a Nietzsche's, Nietzsche fan, you would know that that's where he wrote most of his seminal stuff, tearing apart the early ideas around cat- Capitalism. So thus spoke uh, Zarathustra. He was written in this town. So I could end up in this town as well and, and was able to sort of look at, oh, and I in fact read the book um, and saw that he writes basically a rundown of the eastern suburbs smoothie drinking health fanatic. I'm not joking. Like 
he basically prescribes what is going to happen to our society if we stay caught up in the consumer cycle and this emptiness and this acedia that will come about and this moral aloneness that he talks about that, of course, economists such as David Brooks in the New York Times now discusses at length, this moral disconnect. And he actually predicted it in the exactly the same time as Heidi was frolicking around the next mountain range, like walking distance in a day. He was discussing all of this and he talks about how we were going to become obsessed with our health. We're going to switch off from political engagement. We're going to discuss tiny ideas that go around in circles. I mean, like, it's it's really quite incredible. And I came across these kinds of um, intersecting ideas and found it very much a comfort. Um, and I know that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote to his nephew about this. Um, he said, in times of despair, go and read the work of other great minds because you will find that we've gone through this before and we can learn a lot from these thinkers and we can start to formulate some some hopeful ideas around the fact that we generally activate and engage and rise to a better version of our human selves um, after times of real hardship and and being confronted so um that's what I found. I, I, one of the chapters is about soul nerding, like nerding out on matters of the soul, literature and, and thinkers who've been there before us, because we can see this is what happens. And we have the opportunity to rise out of what I think is a sustained state of adolescence. That's what we're in at the moment into full adulthood. Um, yeah. <laughs> As you can see by my outfit, I'm still in sustained adolescence. Um, <laughs> Uh, we got moment. We got time for a couple of questions. Right. Oh yes, over here. Uh, I think there's definitely hostility towards industry super in Canberra, but I think uh, at the moment I think that all the financial institutions are moving, whether they're industry super or whether they're just ANZ or BlackRock, and that's because it's finally caught up with them that the money is not going to be there. So I think that there's a lot of hostility to industry super. I don't think at the moment it's particularly linked to climate change because in the past people like CBIS, that superannuation fund, even Australian super, was quite kind of reluctant to get to the um, into climate change issues. Now, Australian super's moved, the other big super funds are moving, but that's also because ANZ's moving, because BlackRock's moving. Now, the American banks, some of them ha have not moved as quickly, but I think that, uh, you know, if they think they're going to lose money on it, they're going to move. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eliana. Eliana's question is like, how, how does how does Murdoch, how do the Murdoch press and how do fossil fuel lobbies and fossil fuel industries um, prevent climate action? Well, I think for the fossil fuel companies and some in particular, they have had a very long, long history of this. Part of it's obviously political donations, straightforward stuff we all know about. But I think one of the things I do go into at some length in the book is their extraordinary um, influence on promoting climate scepticism. I think that was really critical, not in Europe, where it never took hold, really, but in Australia and the US for some, for, I guess, obvious reasons, because the fossil fuel industry in both countries are very powerful, um, the undermining of climate science and the funding of undermining to undermine climate science, I think was absolutely central. And, you know, I, I that was one moment when I did kind of wake up. I always knew it was influential, but um, I was chatting to another kind of leading climate uh, sceptic activist in America, one who's organization had been funded by ExxonMobil for quite some time and he sort of just said quite bluntly to me that I mean he obviously believed climate skepticism but he explained that he had argued it was absolutely crucial for them to 
promote climate skepticism because he said, if we don't do that, the moral imperative will be on the side of people who want to take climate action. We will lose the moral high ground unless we promote climate skepticism. So his argument was that, you know, if you've got to look people in the eye and say, yes, the climate science, the mainstream climate science is right, then everyone's going to say, yeah, well, you have to act on climate change. But if you fund climate scepticism that he believed in, then you reduce the moral imperative of that argument. Um, just to, to build on that, um, the, it wasn't so much about saying it doesn't exist. What it did, the main operative, like the psychological tactic that was utilised was seeding doubt. So, and why would you do that? Um, well, you know, for obvious reasons, it makes you kind of, well, I don't want to do anything too major if there's doubt. Um, and, of course, you know, it doesn't matter how often we walk around going, it's confirmed science, it's not up for dispute. Um, if there's doubt, it will actually keep keep people, um, you know, just not wanting to make a, a, a large scale change. But the other thing is, is it's distraction. So while ever you're debating whether it's true or not, and it's a bit like the Romans threw um, bread and circuses to distract the masses from realising they were instigating despotic kind of rule. Um, it's a similar thing. You distract everybody with these small scale petty arguments and the big picture can be forgotten about on the headlines. So it, in terms of a psychological tactic that they were utilising, it, it was a cognitive dissonance that when there's doubt and distraction, um, it can actually steer things. So it wasn't as obvious as just making sure that politicians you know, throwing them some cash and, and not instigating um, policies, it was, there was more subterfuge. Yeah, uh, yeah Cass. So, what Marion talks about in her book um, is to move people from the idea that they are going to do that. Kat said people in their 30s and 40s are absolutely enraged because of the last 20 years of climate action and she wants to know how can we move past the rage? Bring us home, make it hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the rage can lead to acedia because it eventually leads to overwhelm and that is the worst thing that can happen to us. So we need to be on the watch out for that and fight against it with everything we can. And so there's techniques that can do that from a psychological point of view to ensure that huge emotion doesn't actually render us numb and mute and inactive. And that's, I think, what's happening to a lot of young people. They're just like, well, what's the point? Um, I, I think that George Monbiot, um, the thinking woman's climate crumpet from the, from the Guardian, he's the Guardian, isn't he? Yeah, over in the UK. He, um, he has a wonderful phrase that I think was in one of his op-eds a number of years ago where he said, um, to not be enraged, um, you know, you would actually, it would be a highly problematic thing. It's fully human to be enraged at the moment. And I think the discussion that we need to have is that, yes, the rage is absolutely required and dot, 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 we need to act. Unfortunately, the rage can stop us and we can start talking in circles and not actually get engaged in where we need to move forward. I think the change needs to happen in these situations. I know, I spoke to you, didn't I, at Christine Figueres' talk right the day before, you were there as well. I mean, it was surreal. It was the last day of freedom before, I think everything shut down the next day. Um, it was just the day before the apocalypse. But we were having dinner and you were enraged. And now look what you've done, right? So um, there's a wonderful book written by, gosh, what's her name? It begins with M, uh, Margaret Salomon. And she is a climate psychologist. And she's, um, she came out actually uh, this time last year, in fact. And she talks a lot. She's got a book about how turning anger and rage into action. So she's actually the voice on this. And um, I, I refer to some of those her techniques in the book. But there are ways to do that. We have to turn that rage into action. It's almost like we're all A-types, no doubt, in this room. It's almost a call to action. Is that hopeful? That is very hopeful. I think what um, Sarah has articulated here is that we are part of that action. By being here today is symbolic of the action we're taking, and not only in our own communities, but how we hope to spread that um, through our wider communities as well. So um, give yourselves a round of applause for being here tonight. And please thank Mariam and Sarah. And please thank Kath and Delia.
and uh, uh, Eliana as well for putting this on. And Blair, thanks Blair as well. Good on you. Um, and please follow uh, Voices of Wentworth. These guys are sticking around so you can pick their brains uh, for a little bit while they're here. Um, and if you can please follow my podcast, A Rational Fear, uh, if you go to rationalfear.com and, um, uh, and I make a podcast that's comedy and climate change. Uh, we Comedians get together and we shoot the shit about real world issues and then we also drill down on climate change. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking with Sarah on it in the future. Um, the last couple of episodes I've had people like Mike Hannah Brooks on. I've had Yessie Mosby from uh, the Torres Strait on uh, and loads of other interesting folks as well. And please head over and buy a book. I've got mine. I've got my, I've already got it. Sarah. Sarah's one's at home. I've already read it. Um, so thank you. Oh, and a t-shirt. Go buy a t-shirt. So thank you very much for everyone. And um, hopefully we'll see you at the next one of these, probably um, uh, at the uh, at the new stadium they're building. That'll probably be good. That'll be, we'll fill at least 3.5% of the Wentworth population there. So that'll be great. And thanks, Dan, for doing a fabulous job. <laughs>